He, sh he should stop sharing, I think, huh? Yes, I will do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but uh, Kazwaki is muted. Yeah. Okay, you now. have to unmute. Okay. Right. Oh, yes. uh, it's okay now. Did you open the room? Yes. Okay, perfect. <coughs> so when do we want to start with our our trailer? It's up to We're you. We're online, yeah. Uh, you mean the trailer which we already uh, used? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't have it here. Okay. So trailer. you can you can start online, with. Yeah. Uh, Introduction, etc. I will. So perfect. Everybody good to go? Let's do it. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being with the Body Cinema Productions webinar, the first one in June. I would like to salute everyone here, and I will start with my friend from Argentina, Martin Charles. Buenos dias, Argentina. How are you, Martin? Hello, and thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be with such good speakers. Uh, so uh, tell me when, when the video is ready. Okay, I'll tell you. Yes. Don't worry. Let me salute the others. Buenas tardes, España. Professor Carlos Mateo. How are you? ¿Qué tal? How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your kind invitation. And it will be a nice, a nice meeting here. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Guten Abend, Deutschland. We get our friend Nico Tsempalis. Guten Abend. Uh, hi, guys. It's a big honor to be here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. We're going to have fun and learn from each other. I'm sure about it. Thank you. Masal Khairi Amisir. How are you, Ahmed, my friend? Thank you for being with us. Hello, Gustavo. Hello, everyone. It's a great, really a great pleasure to be among this group of fantastic surgeons. And we're going to learn from each other, of course, and I'm so excited about it. Thank you. E Aksham Lar Turki. How are you, Sibel? Hosh Geldenis. Hosh Bulduk, my dear friend. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and uh, Lukan for inviting me to this great webinar. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kombamani Hong, Genki Deska Kazuaki. Yes, oh, Genki Desu, you speak it well, Japanese. <laughs> so I'm, yes, it's a great honor to be invited to this and the wave conference. And I'm really happy to see my friends all over the world. But it is a midnight in Tokyo, and wow. uh, I'm trying not to go to the bed. Arigato <laughs> gozaimasu. <laughs> Dobur den Bulgaria, my friend and my brother Luka Mishev, how are you? Bom dia, Brazil. I'm fine. Thank you for organizing this thing and I hope everything will uh, ride smoothly. Thank you all for being here. Okay, last but not least, bom dia, Brazil. Obrigado por estarem conosco. So, the first one, as always, the ladies, Sibel de Mirel. <laughs> she's, a, she's a great friend. She studied in Switzerland with me and she's a professor now at Ankara University in Turkey. So, you're going to see where we are going to learn a lot with her. Hojam, please. Yeah, thank you, Hojam. Let me share my screen first. I hope it will work. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Uh, now, um, today I will present uh, how I handle coital detachment situation in cases of retinal detachment during vitrectomy. Let me first uh, to make a brief introduction to my case. Uh, she's a young lady who is diagnosed with severe mental illness. Uh, he, she had repeated head and orbital trauma due to self-injurious behavior such as head banging and the eye pressing. Uh, since the mental disorder of hers, at the beginning I was not able to examine her properly, but noticed that recommendation pressure was normal at the beginning, uh, and I scheduled her surgery two days after I saw her. Uh, on the surgery days, it was so surprising uh, to me because the eye was so, uh, extremely soft and I suspected corrigal detachment. Uh, let's see what happened. Uh, my first plan to, to put this trocar. Are you seeing my arrow on the screen? 
Yes. Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I want to put this uh, trocar here with the infusion line. If I see the tip of the infusion line, I will open infusion and make the eye pressure normal and then start with my surgery. However, uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. See what happened? I couldn't see the tip of the line and go with the trocar opitone probe. See, this is corridor detachment and I got stuck in the choroid. And do another one in the supranasal. It work, and I have one trocar. Uh, I switch back to the back of the eye and see what is happening. There is huge corridor detachment in the temple side and also giant retinal tear over 180 degree. I put another one to start. But unfortunately, again, the same thing, I couldn't go, I couldn't go in. I was not able to go in with my uh, Ocuton prop again. I got stuck in the current. So I have only one working. So what will be the next step for me at that time? I, I decided to drain the fluid from the sclera. And that's why I opened conjunctiva, put my infusion line into the superanasal, open the infusion and pick the place where the corridor detachment is highest. And then I use my MVR blade to cut the sclera from seven millimeter from the limbus and drain the fluid as much as possible. You see the fluid uh, is coming out from the uh, sclera cuts and it is pulling over there, over the accartation place. It's, it's coming uh, out profusely, actually. There is, a, there is a huge corridor detachment. That's why we have a lot of fluid there. And it, it's pulling over there. After I finish this step, I put a suture that place and try to put my trocars again. Now I have three. If I did it, I have three trocars to start with trachectomy, but I decide at that time, I decide to remove all lens, the lens capsule and anterior withdraws, all these things on the pars plana place and try to remove all these things, prevent the eye from anterior PVR because she, she has all risk factors. Uh, she's uh, prone to develop PVR, uh, anterior PVR since the risk factors. Uh, and uh, I, clear all the remnant of the lens and the capsule and put another trocar to use my chandelier illumination and switch back to the uh, vitrectomy. As you see here, giant retinal tear is there. Also, I have two more breaks in the nasal. I try to first trim the anterior flap of the tear uh, and I did core vitrectomy, etc. I do what I usually do for giant retinal break. I use uh, two things uh, with uh, under uh, chandelier illuminations. One is forceps, the other one is passive aspirator. And try to get back the retina to normal position. Of course, I use decalin to do that. After I put decalin, the retina is uh, reattached now and I laser around the tear and 360 degree to finish my surgery. And finally, I did fluid fluid exchange and I used one, uh, 1000 centistoke uh, silicone oil as a tamponade. This is how I handle this situation uh, for this lady. I have one more video. Yeah, should I play it? Uh, yeah, it's okay for me. If, if you do that, I will appreciate it. Of course. Okay. Is it on the screen now? No. I think it should be. Yeah, 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 it's on the screen, yes, please. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this is a guy, 33 years old, a man, uh, both, uh, she, he has both retinal and corridor detachments. And the situation is different now. He's aphakic, and that's why I uh, put the infusion line into the AC. Even if I make the pressure normal again, I couldn't get rid of all these corridor detachments. And that's why uh, I did the same thing again. Uh, drain the corridor uh, fluid as much as possible from that I cut seven millimeter from the limbus first. Uh, 
under infusion in the AC, anterior chamber. And after I get rid of the fluid, I do... And try to do vitrectomy under uh, infusion in the AC because still I couldn't go in with the infusion line. After I clear all this anterior vitreous over the pars plana, uh, I relieved all the traction over there and I, I can go in with my uh, standard infusion to the pars plana. And uh, I started doing vitrectomy and I need bimanual surgery and that's why I put one more trocar over that place because there is cradle detachment and that's why I picked that location <clears throat> and see what happened. Hemorrhage was coming profusely from the trocar place because the eye is very myopic, highly myopic and that's why it can happen sometimes. Unfortunately, I have hemorrhage in the eye now and I suddenly stopped my surgery, remove all the trocar and the chandelier lights and uh, uh, put some uh, Q-tip soaked with adrenaline and to stop the bleeding. After I stop the bleeding, I resume my surgery without my chandelier elimination. Finally, I was able to finish my surgery without any problem, thanks God. And uh, 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 yeah, I finished my presentation with two cases uh, who has corridor detachment and retinal detachment and I try to show you how I handle corridor detachment in these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Sibel. Really difficult mm. cases. I like to see complications because retinal <laughs> detachment without complications, it's easy. Uh, we yeah. have a, a question from our audience. Yeah, and sure. They want to know from, I think it is from the first case, how was the retina and visual acuity post-op? Uh, I, I couldn't measure the visual acuity because she has mental retardation. She has very severe mental uh, problem disorder. Uh, the situation is okay now. The, the retina is attached, and I order uh, and I, I also do surgery for the other eye, detachment surgery for the other eye. Now she is using some eyeglasses. Sometimes, sometimes she doesn't want to use it, but uh, the situation is okay now. Perfect, Professor Carlos Mateo. I have one question, Chibel. The, uh, in the first case, you, you, you perform an insectomy. I love an insectomy. I want to show you. But, you know, you, you, you remove everything. You remove yeah. the air capsule and everything. Then the problem is that if you saw in the beginning, the, the iris of this patient was very dilated. I don't know if it's trauma or something. But, you know, the silicone oil in these cases tend to push mm -hmm. iris towards the iris towards the cornea. Then... Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with time, you end with a, you know, a, a linear uh, opacification of the cornea. And, and how do you manage this? You remove the silicone oil. How do you put, it, you know, um, uh, sutures to prevent, you know, yeah. migration? How do you manage this? Actually, uh, the this, this situation was so surprising at the beginning. Uh, I, I am not prepared to that surgery. Uh, and I, I saw these cases with too soft and the, a lot of cradle detachment, etc. Uh, I tried to remove all these things because she, she has many risk factors uh, pr prone, prone to develop anterior PBR. And that's why I did it. And second reason for that, she has mental illness and uh, she trying to, uh, to push to head and the eye. Uh, repeatedly, and that's why uh, probably in the future I, I, I will see some IOL dislocation in the eye, and that's why uh, I try to remove first. And at the beginning, uh, I would not consider to put intraocular lenses or after for this case because I did it for the second eye, and now I have IOL dislocation because of the trauma, hand banging, and that's why. Lucan, uh, Sibel, I have one question to what you contribute. Uh, the corridor detachment happening to the constitution of the eye, highly myopic, or to the length and angle of your incision, not the placement of the trocar, but the length of your incision through the sclera, which can promote uh, um, psychodialysis, in mm -hmm. fact. And that's why I did not push too much when I see the, I got stuck in the corate or the edematous pars plana. 
I stop it and then decided to drain the fluid. And after drain it and the, uh, clean all anterior vitreous, uh, making traction on the pars plana, I, I easily go into the eye. Perfect. Ahmed. Yes, Sibel, you have uh, perfectly demonstrated external drainage of a choroidal detachment in here. Um, but um, I might consider um, another option in this aphakic patient, uh, in aphakic patient, the second case, uh, mm -hmm. when he went to inside with the infusion canyon in the anterior chamber. Sometimes I would uh, drain uh, the choroidal detachment internally. It's for an internal approach. I might go with the, with the cutter from one side and try to push with the uh, trokers on the other side, uh, trying to cut a little bit of choroid sur surrounding the uh, side of entry because the, usually the choroid is so uh, lax and get, tends to be pushed forwards in cases of hypotony. So a little, uh, little cut or a little small bite in the choroid at, at this point could uh, yeah. help in draining, in draining internally uh, the choroidal detachment. Yeah, maybe. Instead of the external drainage, I would uh, think this would be helpful, especially in this affected patient. Yeah, yeah, it might be. Yeah, yeah it's, a good, it's, it's a good treat. Thank you. Yeah. Sibel, last question. How do you choose the silicon oil, 1,000 or 5,000 centistokes, and why in such cases? Uh, uh, the, I, I, uh, when I finished the surgery, uh, I, 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 I finished it without any problem. Uh, I reattach retina, I uh, do all laser, etc. And that's why there is no need to put 1,000 centistoke because I, I, I would remove it after three or four months later. And I did it already, and that's why uh, uh, I would not choose to put 1,000 cents to. If I want uh, to put uh, silicone oil and stay there for a long time, of course, I would do that, but there is no need to do that because uh, I finished my surgery without any problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so to respect the time, our next speaker is our Nihon Jin Tomodachi, Kazuaki <laughs> Kadonosono. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Can you see? Can you see this? My first foot, so first right? No, not yet. You have to share not your screen yet. first. Can you see this right? Right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Right. About this. Yeah. Not yet. Uh, the, first, you open your PPT. Then you come back to Zoom. Plus, uh, you click share screen, then you choose the PPT. It will have small windows. Right. Like you did before. Can you see this? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Very good. Right. So, uh, I would like to talk about the one such great case that I performed recently. So, uh, So this is a patient of a 27 year old man with a retina detachment. His major acuity was a poor in the right eye was counting fingers. He has suffered from atopic dermatitis for a long time. So, uh, and he has, this eye was complicated with a mature cataract. So we couldn't see any fundus in his eye. So a uh, fundus examination is very difficult to see and uh, any fundus and the details in his eye. So echographic showed that there was slight subduction fluid suspecting uh, and a possible render detachment in his eye. So uh, I performed and vitrophy combined with cataract surgery. This is a surgical video I performed on this patient. But before performing a cataract surgery, I have to do a cataract surgery with white mature cataract. In this case, I routinely use the ICG to stain and visualize anterior capsule and the facilitating and the capsule rexes. After removal of ICG, I uh, successfully remove anterior capsule rexes. After and successful CCC, I remove lens cortex and the lens material, and the, uh, I, uh, I, I performed the cataract surgery before doing the vitrectomy. Can you see this, my video? Yes. Gustavo? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the, and I, I didn't any response and get back from the audience. Okay. 
Um, this surgery was performed with 25 gauge vitrectomy. I noticed that there was uh, the large tears which were located in the far peripheral retinas and the past prana, as well as the past pulita. So these findings is very were well, very common in nice with uh, retina detachment due to atopic dermatitis. So first of all, I try to remove any vitreous and by doing vitreous shading with uh, using 25 gauge vitreous color. But it was uh, somewhat very difficult to do uh, the vitreous shading because uh, the eye is a retina detachment, retina is mo very mobile and very at, at the risk of uh, and to make uh, to make uh, retinal tears. So, uh, and I'm doing uh, just shaving in the other regions and the laser retina detachment. So I decided to powerful carbon liquid to flatten the retina, um, the, uh, allowing me to uh, uh, do a bit of shaving more and safely and effectively. And I routine PFCL powerful gum break it into the eye by manually to aspirate and reassess from the uh, um, the, the, from the vitreous cavity. And then powerful carbon break it allows us to uh, do a vitreous shaving and more effectively, more, more and safely. And as you can see, so we uh, found that there was a retina tears around the perfect peripheral retina and I finally uh, the, uh, cut and uh, removed any bitterness uh, contracting and traction force from the retina to the bitterness. And after complete removal of uh, any bitterness along the retinal tears, I uh, get back to the anterior segment. So, uh, and I uh, uh, decided to uh, the implant. So we can see the retina tears on that powerful carbon bracket. So I decided to implant the intraocular lens in, uh, into the anterior chamber, which is uh, 7.0 millimeters long. The lens is nicely implanted into the eye and put the obisode to make the eye contracted. And after an implantation of the interocular lens, I, uh, I put a biscuit on the corner surface and get back to the, into the eye. So I am uh, splitting a subretinal fluid, or retinal tears, and I'm using a 25 gauge between the cutter and the powerful carbon bucket. I uh, add any subretinal fluid and from the retinal tears and I'm using a 25 gauge between the cutter. Um, the, uh, I am uh, finally aspirate any BSS um, from this eye, but I noticed there was a uh, small subretinal fluid in his eye. So after um, the fluid gas exchange, I put a part on the SX6 and the expansive gas, and then I put a laser and around the retinal tears and which were located in the peripheral retina and as well as a pulse prick, a pulse burner. And uh, after and the laser treatment, I asked this patient to take a face down position about seven days uh, after surgery. So this subretinal fluid and the way gone out after surgery. So uh, this is a picture I have and, it, and that was taken seven days after surgery. There was a no retina detachment. OCT showed that no, no retina detachment. There is no subretinal fluid. So this is a taken from messages from in this case. There were unique retinal tears complicated with the retinal detachment with uh, atopic dermatitis. Surgical instrument and PLCL, the 3D vitrectomy allows us to uh, treat uh, this type of uh, retinal detachment. Thank you very much, Gustavo. No, thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. So I have yeah. muted all the all the speakers. You can unmute yourself. Please, Martin, I want your considerations about this video. Very good, Kazuaki. 
Yes, yeah. Dr. Kaswaki, very elegant uh, surgery. I loved it. I also use, even though I use the dual bore cannula, I I use a chandelier also, and the that technique of injecting perfluorocarbon liquid while aspirating with the vitreous cutter is is really excellent because it stabilizes the pressure. Even though you have the constellation that has IOP control, sometimes there is a little bit of vitreous stuck in the infusion line, so it doesn't help the 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 console to to stabilize the 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 pressure so it it's something really lovely uh, congratulations okay. lovely surgery uh, I, I have an, another question what right. optic what what lenses do you use because i i i it seems to have like seven millimeters of optic or yes uh the i routinely use some the large optics and intraocular lens this optic size is 7.3 millimeters. 7.5. I think an average of size of intraocular lens is 6.0 millimeters. I think mm -hmm. that you always use it. But in this case, is I want to uh, uh, the visualization after surgery to check his eye. So I put I uh, I intended to put a large intraocular lens in these cases. So uh, who? Who manufactures those lenses? Yes, uh, this uh, lens was um, and has been manufactured for the Japanese company, the Santem. Santem. Mm -hmm. Santem. Okay, and uh, do they enter through 2.2 or you have to enlarge it to 2.8 or 3 millimeters? 2.8. 2.8. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, three pieces or single piece? Oh, this, this one is uh, three pieces. Three pieces. Yes, I don't think uh, the three and uh, there's zero points and uh, millimeters long interocular lens, and it's always a three and three pieces, not one piece. So I I, I heard that Alcon three years ago was asking us, the key opinion leaders, whether they should go on on building uh, seven seven millimeters lenses or not because of the Japanese. Uh, doctors that love them, but I think they didn't go on that direction. Yes, I think uh, uh, the um, intraocular lens in the retinal detachment case is very important because, uh, and just after surgery, and it is much better and comfortable for us to observe a fundus examination after surgery. Yeah, very good. I don't think we have these IOLs here in the Western countries because seven millimeters for, for example, RCP cases, PCR, sorry, it's amazing. It would, it would help you a lot. Luca, please. Um, I just wanted to ask the secret for the, this good peripheral view with ingenuity, but probably I got the answer because the large optic of the intraocular lens. Uh, I want to ask Kazuaki, is that the answer or you play a lot with the diaphragm of the ingenuity or the focus of the recite? So in this case, I uh, use an ingenuity and with the recite system and allowing me to observe and find the situation more, uh, more and comfortably. So uh, um, the I and uh, when I and I, I, I put uh, I put a obisod and in a fluid gas exchange and it's much better for us to observe much wider angle and if the pupil and becomes smaller. Mm -hmm. So that's why I am using the engine. Thank you. It is very good, very good. Thank you so much, Kazuaki. Our next speaker, my Bulgarian brother, Lukan Mishev. Please, the screen is yours. Okay, let me just. Share it. Do you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Yes. I can see. So this is a case of long-standing retinal detachment, uh, which I find out in the during the surgery that is <laughs> caused by a large macular hole. I tried to peel this macular hole, but in my opinion, with no luck. And if you observe the size of the hole, it's more than a 23 gauge instrument. So it's around uh, 1000 microns. 
So how how can I uh, close this uh, hole in order to actually resolve the retinal detachment? Uh, I tried the peeling, I tried uh, multiple staining <coughs> approaches, but the hole doesn't close. And what are our options? Because if I flatten the retina without closing the hole, it will again redetach. Then I decided to cut a peripheral graft from a retina uh, in order to cover the hole and to have the ability to resolve the case. Uh, I have published that in 2017 <coughs> and uh, the difference between my technique and the technique which Tamer Mahmoud has established is that I take a graft from far periphery. Uh, obviously more challenging but <coughs> there is no bleeding. You can uh, cut the graft without diatermize it <coughs> so you don't kill the uh, vessel tree uh, which you have in the graft you just use the plain old scissor to not traumatize the graft and I don't like to drag the graft under PFCL I like to place it uh, over the macular hole and then to um, keep it there with PFCL. So now obviously this is a technically challenging but it's uh, doable actually. So now I will try to put a PFCL bubble over the graft. It is here I got lucky actually because the graft is really, uh, really uh, light and can float away. There is no stickiness also. You, you need to obey the direction of the photoreceptor part and the upper part. When it is, it is under the PFCL, you can adjust the position over the macular hole. And that was my solution for this case in order to close the hole. Uh, because this is a long-standing retinal detachment the graft is graft is thick so the retina in the periphery is already contracted in a radial and circumferential direction so i decided to cut the retina in 360 degrees in order to uh, reshape or use the shape of the remnant retina to be well attached to the uh, pigment epithelium of the sclera so now this is the 360 degrees lasering and uh, what I do after finishing the laser I go to direct PFCL silicon exchange because if you go to uh, fluid air exchange the possibility to lose the graft is really high. Uh, in that way you have more controlled implantation of the silicon. This is the graft after the uh, silicon PFCL exchange. This is first day after surgery, the vertical plane of this scan. This is the coronary scan or end phase OCT. Uh, this is a few months later. You can observe the transformation and integration of the graft and here you can see the uh, um, membrana limitants uh, external present and the line of photoreceptors. So that was my case. Gustavo, all are muted. Sorry, yes, yes. Yeah. Amazing <laughs> technique, really difficult. You have to have some skills already. It's not for beginners. Ahmed has a question. Uh, very nice technique to demonstrate, demonstrate the autologous retinal graft here, uh, Lucan. Uh, but I would I'd like to ask you, uh, the size of the macular hole that too big that you consider an autologous graft in this case, uh, I think um, this hole could be uh, managed with maybe with, uh, with an inverted flap uh, on the perforocarbal, for example, and I would reserve this uh, autologous retinal graft maybe for a recurrence. 
or more um, uh, in case of a recurrent or persistent hole after the primary surgery. So what do you think about it? Did, was the hole size that big or a chronic hole that you consider uh, an autologous retinal graft in this case? Actually, the issue here is that there is no flap from EOM that I can harvest because the uh, myopic retina is really thin and we know that it is uh, really difficult to harvest a flap. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing, uh, I personally don't believe in uh, EOM stuffing uh, the macular hole because the EOM uh, can only be a scaffold but not functional uh, part from the retina. As, we, as I saw in uh, my cases, I have more than 10 uh, retina auto-transplantation cases, there is a migration or transformation of uh, Mueller cells to photoreceptors. This is one of the uh, hypotheses which explains why such grafts are getting functional results. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Kazuaki on that because I know he also has experience with that. Can you comment on that? Yes, I think and your surgery is very nice and excellent. So, uh, but uh, uh, the, I would like to ask you about uh, visual acuity after surgery. And then, and uh, if you uh, comment on the survival, survival transplanted retina. So I think that this, uh, and this graft can affect visual acuity outcome. How do you think about the visual acuity after transplantation? I will start with the technique of harvesting. As I saw uh, other surgeons, they always use diatermy uh, before uh, harvesting the graft. I think the diatermy uh, causes uh, coagulation of the vessel tree, which is in the graft. We know from the plastic surgery that there is no better instrument than the sharp knife to harvest a skin. So the same is here. Uh, when I don't, when I harvest the graft, I don't damage it. Then the second thing, I noticed uh, a few surgeons that are dragging the graft from periphery to the muller under PFCL. So if we suppose that there are progenitor cells which can later uh, transformate to photoreceptors, you will kill them by dragging them under PFCL. And in terms of visual acuity, in my cases, I have from 0.1 uh, to a remarkable 0.6, one case, of course. All of them are around 0.1 to 0.3 maximum. But I have one with uh, 0.5 and I see uh, the um, membrana limitans externa and I see the ESOS line forming in the graft. So something is definitely happening there. The only thing that I don't have in my series is micro -per perimetry, because the yeah. micro perimetry can definitely point if this is parafovel fixation, is this a parafovel uh, belt or macular fixation? I don't have the answer for that. Did you find out the positive response to by the MP3? Excuse me? How about the return to MPC? Microperimetry? Yes, I don't have MPC. This is uh, a weakness. I don't have, I only have OCT and fundus autofluorescence. Mm -hmm. So we have Professor Matteo, one of the greatest macula experts in the world. I want your opinion. Actually, everybody wants your opinion. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wonderful surgery. Um, I, I prefer to try to harvest ILM under preferred carbon liquid because, you know, I think it's by far easier. You, you do it the perfect, but, you know, the, the, the retina remains stable. Uh, I do these graphs under PFCL. You're, and you're right. When you drag all of these you know, through the retina to the macro hole, you can see that you are losing photoreceptors. But anyway, um, the case I thought, all of these kind of cases improve vision. All of them. Why? Because you reattach the retina. If you reattach the retina, patients see better. But my vision never went more than, you know, 2200, no more. And after one year or after two years, I have some cases more than two years, they develop, you know, they, they have the graph in the middle. So this is contracting. And I have macroedema around. 
then, you know, um, I, I don't know if this is something more than a plaque. I don't know. But, you know, 1K.6 is amazing. Amazing. You know, you have, we have to work on this. And, and I think your technique of doing with one hand, you, you, you know the difficulty to maintain the graph there with the forces because, you know, yeah. the graph tends to float, yeah. not to and then you put perforogarbon liquid in the graph, becomes to groove. Then, um, but you know, what's great, the surgery was great, the case, and you know, congratulations for this case. Thank you. Lucan, what is the tip to don't have the graph flowing? It was, I wanted to mention that. Um, actually, I don't have a tip for that. You need to have a good <laughs> Eckert forceps to hold it because it can float anytime. Yeah, like Professor Mateo said, you have to pray or call an ophthalmologist. Exactly. It be easier. Exactly. <laughs> okay, let's go forward. Professor Carlos Mateo, you are the next one, please. Hey, let me share my screen. Then this one. And then play. See my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, it, then. It's on two okay. screens. Let's, yeah, okay, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, okay. Okay, look at this. We learned. Uh, uh, we thing about matrix you know uh, and i'm going to show you some cases um of uh, perforating trauma let me let me show you what happens in in matrix oh i changed my slide yes okay in matrix we learned that you know neo was able to stop the you know, all of these bullets and no no intraocular foreign bodies and nothing there uh, but you know in the real life things are a little bit different okay now let me show you uh, my cases that uh, one of them were rare cases. Then, then uh, years ago, I had this 41 years old male that was hammering and a piece of metal hit his right eye, then vision dropped down. And CAT scan reported and announced the intraoperative foreign body. And then right eye was sutured and the patient was sent for eye intraoperative foreign body removal. Visual acuity was hand movement, no pain, but the patient apart from vitreous hemorrhage had white cells in the vitreous cavity. And this is the eye, you know, you can see the so conjunctival hemorrhage, you see the eye. Now you will see where the eye was closed. We opened the code. It wasn't 10, 10 years ago, it was in 20 gauge. This is the, you know, the sutures that some surgeon uh, put there. And then I went there and, you know, I began my vitrectomy. I saw the hemorrhage. I saw this white vitreous, this is, you know, uh, initial uh, dophthalmitis. And, and, you know, um, I, I removed everything. I saw this break in the retina and I saw this white area. Then I touched these two hemorrhage, hemorrhages because they, I, I touched the, the, this piece, but I didn't feel anything. And I tried to find the foreign body because, you know, uh, the, the CAT scan report said intraocular foreign body. Then I went down the retina. I began to remove all these subretinal hemorrhage and I tried to touch this and I couldn't. And then I, you know, continue to remove all of this blood and the retina. I didn't find anything. And at the end, I put perforocarbon liquid to, to, you know, to, to squeeze this hemorrhage out. I, 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 you know, I review my peripheral retina and I remove the internal limiting membrane. This is why my take home message, always when you have a heat near the macro area, always remove the, uh, the internal limiting membrane. I did laser at the end, Look at this and the perforocarbon liquid. This is three weeks later, silicone oil, you know, all was, you know, scarred, but it's nice. But what is the foreign body? You know, and then I repeat the CAT scan and I said, okay, do another CAT scan to see where is the foreign body. And the foreign body is there. And it seems that it's inside, but it's not inside. In, in fact, this is outside because I couldn't see it inside. Look at this, is, uh, this is the same CAT scan. And then I followed this patient for, for 10 years. And at the end, the foreign body was there, where it was where, you know, I thought it was, but it's in the, in the wall, in the outer wall of the eye. This was not in the eye. Then my message to you, because this patient at the end has a visual beauty after 10 years of 2032. And I think part of this is related to the removal of the internal limited membrane, because with, with this kind of scar, all the radia could be, you know, a uh, drag to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the exit side. 
Steps are important in perforating trauma. When you you have to remember that when you remove the vitreous plaque, the eye becomes unstable. Look at let me show you this case. It's very simple. You know, I remove the cataract and then I do my vitrectomy, and you have the exit side. I remove the posterior vitreous. And you have to remember that when you remove the plaque of the vitreous in this exit, you know, the eye becomes unstable. You have some water going out of the eye, you know, ballooning the uh, the conjunctiva. And then, if you have to do something more, be careful. Don't remove the plaque in the beginning. And this takes me to the second case, the third case. This is uh, six years ago. It was a 12 years old male. He was hammering again, and a piece of metal hit his right eye, and a division dropped. The right eye was sutured and sent uh, to us for for removal of the, let's say, drug or foreign body. Ms. Lakuti was putting finger, fingers, no pain, no signs of infection. It was a soft cataract in vitreous hemorrhage. And this is a discussion that I always have with uh, Tanasis the other day. Tanasis Nicolagopoulos was saying that I, we always argue, we always discuss. And this is one of the main topics we discuss. In cases like this, I always perform, as Tibel mentioned before, I always perform lensectomy because the lens is so soft. Is so easy. You try to maintain, to, to preserve the entire capsule. You polish it, and your visualization will be great. If you have an for it better, you can remove it for an entire chamber. Then I went there, and I began to see where it was the foreign body. And I made the, the first mistake. I removed the ILM, I had, excuse me, the posterior hyaluron, but I had the foreign body there. And you have two options, push or pull push to the orbit or pull it, trying to put inside the eye and because the, the, the foreign body was up. I decided to, to try to remove the foreign body. It was no magnetic that I couldn't, with the magnet, I couldn't do anything. And then I put the forceps through the sclera. I grasped it. It was very difficult to grasp it, but you know, it was not in a good direction. But at the end, I removed it. As I, as I told you, a key point in these cases for me is to remove the ILM. And up to here, I didn't remove the eye. Then I opened the eye, I removed the foreign body, and now when you have all of this done, then your eye is unstable. And it's very difficult in this in this kind of situation to remove the ILM. The first by the internal limiting membrane. And this is the aspect after removal removal of the internal limiting membrane. Let me show you another case, exactly the same. Uh, this patient was um, always uh, was um, hammering, um, you know, fixing a machine. Again, cataract. I prefer not to reopen the entire chamber. I put some visco material. Then I, I clean the, the lens material. I polish the capsule. Again, you see the vitreous hemorrhage. And you arrive to the entry, to the exit side of the eye. The, inter the falling body was in the orbit, not inside the eye. Then in this eye, I remove all, all of the uh, vitreous hemorrhage. And then I put, I, I stain with brilliant blue. I put some viscoelastic material, pressure very low. You know, you have to be at 10 to avoid all of these perforable liquid leading the eye through the posterior exit. And I remove the internal limited membrane. As you can see here, I did the laser around the break. I remove all of these uh, up to the up to the uh, to the to the exit of this of this and at the end you have the anterior capsule you put the lens in the circus that is the place where all of Tina is smooth you know it's very uh, it's very near from the scar and you know no 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 lines of structure etc let me show the last case is a hunting accident this is my last key point it was a hunting accident and your know, cat scan report showed a foreign body into the right orbit and visual acuity was light perception pressure was 10 and look at the case the first thing i made is to clean the anterior chamber i did it with a, a viscoelastic material pressure was fake um, I, I i started to remove this this uh, this hemorrhage, you know, the exit side was near the inferior arcade. I began to uh, to clean all of this hemorrhage, and I found the you know the uh, you know the, the posterior exit, and I did it again. I removed the interlimited membrane in this case, and uh, we are we are removing blood now. Visualization was not very good, but I couldn't with with the assistance of the dye of blue or brilliant blue. I removed the internal limiting membrane, as you can see here. And then I exchange my air. I, I, I never use uh, direct exchange, you know, it's a, you know, a, a 
you know, my preference. And then I did laser on their hair. And at the end, I decided I, I've been 10 years telling people, don't put silicone oil in these cases. Don't use it. And then I made the mistake. I use it. And then I started to inject silicone oil. And, you know, uh, I, I lower my pressure to 10, but, you know, when you inject silicone oil, you are increasing the pressure, the alcohol pressure. And then I saw how these, uh, you know, bubbles of silicone oil, heavy silicone oil in that case, were exiting and entering, getting in and out from the, from the posterior brain. And I decided not to end with all of this silicone oil in the orbit. And uh, I, I remove as much as possible the silicone oil in the eye and then I, I, I exchanged my SF6. And, and you know, you, you can anticipate what, how was the pressure the day after. The day after the intraocular pressure was 17. Then don't use, don't use silicone oil in these cases. Unfortunately, three weeks later, the gas disappeared, and one month later, the patient developed a retinal detachment. Now the eye is closed. I, re I remove the remnants of these, uh, you know, these, uh, of this uh, silicone oil that injected. Then you can you can manage this with a retinal detachment. And then I did my laser. And look at this. There is no dragging from the posterior break to the fovea. The fovea, the, the, the location of the fovea is normal. There are no many lines radiating from the from the scar. Look at these are two cases, very old cases. I did it the same. You know, this this case I have more than 10 years, 20 years, I mean. And then look at this, when you remove the ILM, you know, the retina relax. You know, in Japan, um, Terasaki, Dr. Terasaki described how when you remove the ILM, the you know the retina tends to relax to the nasal side. It's, to Terasaki was the first to describe this, and that's all my 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 tricks and my, you know uh, many of these uh, uh, things are you know subject of discussion and you know I'm I'm open of your comments or you know criticism I like the criticisms. Tanasi is not there unfortunately to criticize all of this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing, really nice. Thank you for showing these interesting cases. Nico, I want your opinion on those cases. I know you are a great surgeon. I enjoyed it. And um, I just have a comment on the last one. You said that um, you suggest not to use oil in these cases. Um, but I think uh, that you used a heavy oil like Denzeron or uh, Oxan HD. And um, that's the problem with oil going into the orbit, because um, the problem with using gas is that with a big possibility, you will accept an, a new uh, retinal detachment. So I think if somebody is cautious and uh, uses normal oil and not the heavy one, there's no big deal of uh, oil ending up in the orbit. I haven't yeah. seen that yet. I <laughs> use oil all the time for these cases. Let me tell you why I've been 20 years selling the same, because 20 years ago, I have a, a, a nice guy, 31 of December, have a car accident. He has a piece of, you know, the, the, the crystal entering the eye and then go outside, okay? Then I put non-heavy silicone oil because I, we, we didn't have. All the non-heavy silicone ended under conjunctiva. And then the eye, uh, you know, two weeks later, was half of the eye was silicone oil and all of the oil was in the orbit. Then, you know, the, in this case, I use it because the brain was inferior. And then I tried to do it like this. But, you know, I don't think it matters the kind of oil. I think it creates a fistula, the oil. But, you know, I made the mistake because I knew it. And, and I said, okay, why not? You know, do it. You know, only one case in your life. Then I did it. And I saw this, you know, moving oil outside the eye. Great. And how do you remove this oil in the orbit when it happens? Oh, you, no, no. To remove can... oil in the because you know it stays under conjunctiva and the tenons and always stays there you open the conjunctiva you remove some bubbles but at the end you always have you know um uh, oil yeah it's almost impossible actually virtually impossible look at uh, let the lady first sibel uh, please, please go ahead okay Okay, uh, I have no criticism for sure, just uh, um, I want to learn something from you. Uh, how do you uh, deal with the uh, hypotony during that surgery? When you remove the uh, intraocular foreign body from the posterior part of the eye, the, uh, the, from the ball, you're going to end up with a hole in it. And uh, during the surgery, probably you will end up some hypotonia even after the surgery. 
So there is a gap, in, there is a fistula in between. Do we have something um, to prevent this thing, such as fibrin clots or some uh, retina tissue, etc., or flap or other things? Did you try it before? And I, I heard that from some colleagues. Uh, they, they, they put some fibrin clots uh, during the surgery, and then they can easily deal with the hypotony uh, uh, during the surgery and after the surgery. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. The, 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 the question is wonderful. Uh, the other day, when I was with Glad Shepard in another webinar, and she told me that you know she was trying to put you know um, amniotic membrane. And this yeah. is a great idea. This is a great idea. I never tried, but you know, let me tell you, always remove you know from the break, posterior break at the end. Do all of you want to do, and at the end you remove it. Then don't forget this eye, you know, you maintain the pressure, you put air in the eye, and you maintain the pressure at, let's say, 30, you know, no problem. And the day after, or in my case, you know, if you have a big break, all of the eye cut, then you, know, you, you don't have any option. But, you know, for this kind of break that I show you, the day, all cases, the day after, 17, 10, right. 12, 27, it depends on, you know, but, you know, Grazia Bertil mentioned the, the idea of, of uh, Stanislaw Rizzo uh, to use amniotic memory for everything in the eye, you know, then, then it's great. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. But I never tried, but yeah, I think it's a good idea to use it. Uh, thanks to Stano and, and Grazia. Martin, go ahead. Yes, uh, Carlos, congratulations for your presentation. It was lovely. I think your key points were perfect, the island peeling, um, and uh, to avoid silicon oil. And my first case of these cases with the intraocular, intraocular foreign body inside the, the, the wall of the eye, the posterior wall, I removed it. And then I had those <laughs> uh, folds, like radial folds coming. And I thought, what, what the hell is this? So um, it is important to, to be aware that it's not an actual hypotony. It's because the, the liquid goes inside the orbit and it's like a compartmental syndrome. And if I think if you want to go and rise the intraocular pressure to 40 or 50, I think it will get worse. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I fully agree. Nice, nice topic. Next. Ahmed, you are, your microphone is muted, please. Very quick and then we can move forward. Okay. Yes, I definitely agree that the removal of this uh, foreign body, or even if it's a vitreous plugger in the posterior board, could bring uh, things uh, worse. Uh, if I have to remove this vitreous plug, I keep it at the end of the surgery. I just uh, do an island surrounding it and separate all the choroid and all the retina from this part and leave this vitreous plug at the end of the surgery. It's more. Uh, if I have to remove it in the middle of the surgery, I have to make sure that my infusion cannula, the stream of the fluid cannula is not... disastrous at that case. So I, I might consider delaying this step as much as I can to the end of the surgery if it's a small hole. If it's a foreign body, then I don't have any other option than the amniotic membrane. So I think this is uh, uh, perfectly demonstrated by Dr. Carlos, and it's, uh, it's a great idea to uh, to plug this with uh, the with with amniotic membrane. Lokan, the last one, then yes. we'll move forward. Uh, actually, I want to thank uh, Dr. Matteo about uh, this point because i don't think the faults that are happening after removing the uh, foreign body are from the <clears throat> orbit this is a fluid going between the sclera and in the suprachoroidal space the only thing that can drive away that fluid is the surface tension tension of the air so his approach uh, don't get me wrong i'm a silicon lover actually i want i love to use it but in that particular case, he's 100% right because the surface tension, tension of the gas can keep the shape of the eye uh, uh, maintained and the pressure will be good enough. No silicon can maintain that. So we will accept the second surgery for uh, retinal detachment, but we will uh, keep the globe in nice shape. Thank you. Fully agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, really nice case. Thank you. So next one is this presenter. Let me prepare here. One, the first case I'm going to show you, I presented in at the AAO in 2018. It's a classic, but it's perfect for this webinar. Let me just find it here. 
to show it to you. Share computer sound, okay. So, can you see it? Mm -hmm. okay. You are just about to finish your vitrectomy. The periphery is shaved and laser has been done. We'll so let's perform no. the fluid direct we are, and go home. We are, we are hearing it, but we only see the file. The you file that has file? been pressed. Yes. yes. Okay. Let me see again. Let me just go back to Zoom. And then stop share. And I'll go to share again. Probably I had the same problem as Sibel had. Let's see now. Uh-huh. I'll open the file first. One second because it's wrong here sorry for that okay now zoom so let's see if i can do it now or maybe yeah i know what's happening one of the five windows has one and one application that doesn't go ahead so let me just close this one and open with a different application. Sorry for that. Open with... So I think now we are good to go. Let's see. And you tell me if it doesn't work. Nothing happens. Ah. Now? Now, now, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Yes? Okay, let's go. You are just about to finish your vitrectomy. The periphery is shaved and laser has been done. So let's perform the fluid air exchange and go home. But oops, the air pressure is zero. That means your air pump is not working. So you cannot finish the surgery. And as this problem is not enough, the closest technical assistance is almost a day away from where you are working. Then you have an idea. Let's use the wall's oxygen. But here comes the issue. How can we measure the air pressure? So I'll ask the audience to help me considering the manometer we have in front of us. How many millimeters of mercury is one kilogram per square centimeter? If you said A, B, C, or D, you are wrong. The right answer is this. Are you sure you want to use that watch at the wall? It doesn't seem very precise or safe. So we need a tool inside the OP room that could help us to manage the air pressure more precisely. And there is no better option if your vitrectomy machine is not working than the anesthesia cart. Here you can see that we have the oxygen tubing installed with a three-way stopcock in order to leave the original tubing to avoid hypoxia and add a second one which will substitute the compromised air pump. Everything is set, but we still don't know how to measure and control the air pressure. The solution was invented by Samuel von Bosch in 1881. It is easy besides being very precise. It is called sphygma manometer. We connect it to the tubing and here we use the O2 humidifier to adjust the pressure we want as a target. And last but not least, don't forget to connect the air filter between the tubes in order to deliver clean air into the eye. After all, even in extreme situations, patient safety is our number one concern. Happy fluid air exchange and thank you all for the time and attention. Okay guys, this was the first video. Let me check the other one which is a trauma case. You are crazy, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just organize this here. Open with, it must be quick time because Windows is not helping me. Okay, let me just put this here. Okay, now we are good to go. Let me share the screen again. Quick time here. This one. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go. So, 
this is a case it was one of the first tra traumas i have done in my life so here are many suggestions for people as you can see here i'll give a stop you can see the anterior chamber how it was i have already removed the cataract so we don't have much time and look how big is this detachment it's totally detached i start with low vacuum because there was i was really unsafe i didn't have any experience i can see a hole and we're gonna see there is subretinal fluid which i'm aspirating in order to see if the retina goes back to its place but since we have vitreous i still haven't started the a good i still haven't performed a good vitrectomy the retina goes doesn't go back because there, there it is full full of traction okay so one of the things i had after trying for 20 or 30 minutes i inject pfo and you're gonna see all the rest of the subretinal fluid coming up they pay attention on here look the yellow fluid how it comes beautifully and then slowly you're gonna see the posterior ball and for my happiness at that moment because i wasn't being careful i was scared actually i can see the posterior ball a little bit of it so i fill it with perfluorocarbon i can see a little bit and that makes my life a little bit easier to start performing a safer vitrectomy Still, you can see still the vitreous. It's a young patient, so the vitreous is sticky. I start to perform the vitrectomy with more safety. And suddenly, you're going to see in the next moments, I perform another hole. In these cases, because it's the retina was still unstable here, I do a hole. So I stop and then I re inject more perfluorocarbon because it was still difficult to perform it. So it's not don't be afraid to use pfo when you have trauma cases it's like everybody knows the term the third hand i start doing the vitrectomy close to the periphery a good shaving and this video is really edited so i did it for a long time so i start fluid air exchange and then you're gonna see i have a choroidal detachment as Sibel showed as professor mateo showed everybody has choroidal detachment when things are not going well so and I have a hemorrhage. I don't know where it came from. I didn't touch that part. So I leave the PFO on the posterior pole. I do laser around the parts where I can see there are ruptures because of the trauma. And slowly I start to perform laser in the periphery. I do two or three crowns usually in these cases because it's full of holes that you cannot see. And at the end I go and aspirate. There is a mild choroidal detachment but I prefer not to manage with it because it has been a long surgery, almost two hours. And then I leave the patient a fake kick, okay? I later did the secondary IOL implantation. Here I do, I always like to do an inferior iridotomy. And this patient, after I think I waited like 60 days to perform the IOL implantation, the retina besides being attached it was unstable because lots of holes and that's the case my friends thank you so much thank you thank you gustavo Gustavo, so, i have a question please go ahead Sibel. so uh you you put your decalin to reattach the retina and uh -huh. you you didn't remove it until you do fluid fluid exchange am i right Yes, that's right. Okay. And what, now, uh, yes? what about the uh, attachment of posterior hyalate or something like that? Did you did you clear and remove all the vitreous from the eye before you? Actually, that, no. That's an excellent question. The posterior hyaloid was already detached in this case. The vitreous it was just attached in the periphery, and the posterior part there was almost no vitreous when I started when I injected it. So there was no problem. The patient, I see him. I think I saw him like six or eight months ago. He had no PVR. He is fine. He is happy. So, so you 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 remove all the vitreous space, shaving, etc. You did it, yes. right? Okay. Yes, yes. In this in this video, of course, we don't have the time, but it was almost two hours of surgery. And nowadays, what I like to do, I still didn't have the the experience on that time. This surgery has like five or six years. I nowadays I inject oil first and then I remove the PFO later. I think the retina becomes more stable. I think I think you and Kashwaki 
show two cases that is wonderful to say, be careful with the peripher peripheral vitreous. You know, the, the vitreous of Kaswaki was, you know, very difficult to, you know, remove because the retina was so mobile, Kaswaki, and your case was amazing, you know, is the retina so mobile and to, to, to tell people that to remove the peripheral vitreous is not that easy. And in my opinion, you never remove all the vitreous. And, you, you know, be careful with this because it's so difficult. It's so adherent more, much more in young patients like your patient. The perhaps was disguises of the posterior hyaluronic as Simeon mentioned. This is a young patient. Many of these eyes have the posterior hyaluronic they attach. They, they, it remains there. And then is the PVR you have later. You know, this is the contraction of the posterior hyaluronic with cells and all of this. But, you know, it's an amazing case and, you know, a wonderful vision. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Actually, it was my, my concern, as you said, because young patients, the sticky vitreous, and yeah. I was scared to perform more holes in the per periphery, which could bring me more problems in the future. So I, I, was, I was also lucky, lucky because I had this posterior vitreous detachment. Yeah. Let me ask you because one thing. Very, very, very good. Would you consider a square buckle in this case? Uh, I, do, I don't have a big experience with buckling, but, see, but yes, I would consider. Remember, my opinion, if you do have a square buckle in this case, you reduce your problems in the periphery, in my, in my so, opinion. You mean peripheral so, circles? You mean, you mean combined line, yes, vitrectomy plus buckling. But it is circlage, not... Uh, ah, circlage, yes, okay. <laughs> Another discussion with Tarasis. Tarasis perhaps is there waiting for me. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of buckle lovers in this group also. <laughs> right. Yes, I know. It's an insider with Lucan. We, we, we love buckling, both of us. And, uh, and we have no time for that. <laughs> no. Okay, that, that, that's an idea for the next webinar because this discussion is endless, okay? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Martin Charles from Argentina. He has won the best, best video award in ASRS many times. It's a pleasure and a real honor to have him with us. Martin, please. Hey, thank you for the invitation, Gustavo and Luca. So I will talk about three surgical cases in retina detachment, retina tear. Should I play it? Okay. Um, so the idea of this video is to to talk about three surgical cases uh, two of one of giant retinal tear and one from pvr this is a paper that we presented with dr francone who is working with me this years this year at asrs annual meeting about extensive island billing in pvr and um, consecutive cases of 11 eyes of 11 patients that underwent a pvr vitrectomy using red and blue g dye uh, pause here, please. Um, Sorry. Consecutive cases of 11 eyes of 11 patients that underwent PVR vitrectomy using brilliant blue G dye. We peel the eye lamp from posterior pole up to the periphery, thus ensuring the total removing of our overlying epiretinal membranes. Frequent restaining of eye lamp helped uh, revealing new edges, and uh, perfluorocarbon liquid was used to stabilize the retina. We can play, please. Fovio and collaborators in 2018 showed that peeling of ILM in cases of retina detachment and PVR with macula off prevented the development of new membranes and diminished the possibility of red detachment. So this is the first of two cases of PVR. This is um, a combined uh, cataract and vitrectomy surgery. I like to place the chandelier on 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 our 12. I, I love to implant the intraocular lens. This is uh, an Acrisoft IQ. I had to, to put iris retractors. I always put chandelier illumination in uh, between my two hands in our 12. So I start the vitrectomy, uh, doing a core vitrectomy. Look at that fixed star. Uh, so the idea of this surgery is to to stain and restain the posterior pole and the, uh, the periphery with blue, brilliant blue cheat eye. I start building the ILM from the posterior pole. I think the video stopped. 
Yes, perfect. I continue peeling the ILM, and the idea of, of peeling the ILM is to peel the ILM and the overlying uh, membranes, so it, it helps us to find a natural cleavage plane of the membranes of PBR that are uh, underlying over the, the ILM. So uh, this is uh, the first day post-op. This is the, the OCT with the retina attached and three months post-op and nine months post uh, silicon oil removal. So this is the, the end of this uh, first case. Um, the second case is, is a pseudophagic uh, case. Um, this patient, uh, we also place uh, four entries uh, with 25 gauge pulp trucker cannulas. I, I li like very much to uh, perform auto indentation so as to, to it helps us uh, to, to view all the periphery and, uh, and really make a lovely shaving of all the, the vitreous space. I do not uh, place uh, bands or buckling in these cases. Look at that little uh, retina tear. So once we get rid of all the beaches, although we have like a summering ring, the, the visualization is really good. I, I tried to, to put the chandelier in different sites, but I, I keep uh, loving the uh, at 12 o'clock. So uh, after staining the ILM with brilliant blue G dye, I start the peeling of the ILM. Here is under PFO. Look at the membranes that are overlying the ILM and look at the, the light uh, or known uh, staining, uh, some places where it stains and some places where it doesn't stain uh, that uh, it, it's telling us that there are epiretinal membranes. Fluid air exchange, endo drainage through a retinal tear. This is a post operative. And uh, look at the pre and post OCT. And this patient, I had to reoperate it uh, to make a, a retinotomy um, on the second surgery. And this is uh, two months after second surgery without siliconoid. And this is my last case about my technique in giant retina tear. This is a patient uh, that came with very good vision, 2020, with a giant retina tear. Uh, so look at the great visualization that, that Chandelier in, in, in our 12 gives. Uh, I really enhance everyone to, to start using Chandeliers in, in all cases. I, I use them in all cases, not on macula, simple macular cases, but on, on all cases like uh, uh, retina detachment, uh, EDR, diabetic retinopathy, trauma. The lovely thing about using chandelier is that it helps us to perform the auto indentation. And this is really, really important so as to, to get rid of all the pictures and to have a really good image of the of the periphery of the retina. Look here, we have a little retina break in a retina attached region. Um, so with one hand, we have the picture scatter. I I um, use maximum cut rate, fixed maximum cut rate, and proportional vacuum and look how we can we can manage to to see all all of the picture space and have a really good looking of all the retina and uh, and make a really good job in in shaving the picture space so again maximum cut rate on all the surgery look here here we have a, another retina break in an attached re uh, retina region. If the patients, I routinely uh, perform OCT, even though the retina is attached or, or detached, and if the patient has a little 
apiretinal membrane, I routinely um, peel the ILM. If the ILM or there's no retina uh, traction, I leave the ILM alone. So here under PFO, I stabilize the posterior pole and uh, end up here I, I, I make like a little massage over the retina that it, it, it's a little bit inverted. Under PFO, I perform endophotoagulation. And um, as I am depressing with the other hand, another time using the chandelier. And then um, look again, the outer indentation I, for the last seven years, I, I'm doing like this kind of surgery uh, by myself, and it's it's really lovely, and it changed the way that I I work. So this is the postoperative images. I left the eye with the C3 F8, five weeks post-op, and uh, a really lovely macula and a really lovely uh, visual acuity in post-op. So thank you. This is the end. Really nice case, Martin. Congratulations. Dif difficult and beautiful images. I have a question. What, would you change for silicone oil or would you keep for, with gas? In, in giant retinal tears, I, I usually use gas. Uh, if there is any sign of PVR, I I prefer silicone oil, but uh, if I think it will go well with gas, I I, I try gas. Nice, Ahmed. Uh, yes, uh, actually, there's been a lot of popularity nowadays about the primary ILM peeling in uh, many cases of retina detachment, uh, particularly the complex cases, uh, traumatic cases, pediatric cases, and uh, some cases of the giant retina tears. But um, there have been, uh, as for giant retina tears, there have been some reports on uh, post-operative uh, macular hole creation after induction of ILM peeling in the primary procedure. Have you have you faced this in your series, or was it uh, 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 an uncommon complication? And would you peel? So we say of a giant retinal tear, if you face a case which is a fresh detachment uh, without any unrolled edges, or without any rod edges, or without any PVR, you would go for the same procedure and peel the ILM as well? If, if the retina, if the macula looks okay, I don't routinely peel the ILM, but if I think it's there is a PVR or, or some retina traction or attraction in the other eye, I, I peel the ILM. I think the, the peeling, we, we all see different kind of surgeons. I think the the complications related of on macular peeling is very related on of the skills of the surgeons as well. Lucan, uh, hi. Yes, Kazuaki, go ahead. Okay. So uh, Martin, great job, excellent surgery. So Thank could you. you tell me, could you tell me how much of the internal limiting membrane? Do you routinely peel nicely with PVR? Uh, as far as I can. As far as I can, and I try to involve the, the, the folds. So I go in that direction. I don't peel the ILM on the retina that is not with PVR. That is, it's usually, the, the non-PVR retina is usually the up, the, from the middle to the up. So. So the area involved with PVR, that is the, the, the down periphery of the retina, I, I usually go in that direction and I start like peeling the ILM in uh, like a triangle. And I try to go as far as possible. Uh, I first use the, the, on the first part, I usually use the, the direct contact lens, but on the periphery, I, I use the, the biome uh, okay. to, to peel the ILM. Okay, in a general normal retina detachment, do you peel primary and the removal of internal limiting membrane in a normal case? No, if there's no sign of PBR or, or macular attraction, I do, I do not. And also, I, I want to enhance this case series were done with the, with the ingenuity. And I think on these difficult cases, there is 
we have like better better visualization of the ilm and better um, magnification and it, it helps us to to get the job better done okay. um, i want to ask how often uh, or if you face first slippage on giant retinal tears with gas and uh, inner inversion of the uh, retina edge and would you consider radio cuts along the giant tear to prevent that um, if this this case had a little inversion and i massaged it i i did a little massage of the of the edges and uh, i think the the slippage of the retina is very uh, connected to the inap inappropriate uh, endodrainage through the through the border of the subretinal fluid from the border of the of the giant retina tear. So I I, I do not use direct um, silicon BFC exchange. I think it's I never tried it, but I think it's like a little bit tricky and uh, if you don't have the correct um, management of the intraocular pressure perhaps I, I have heard a friend of mine that blew uh, an eye and uh, so we are talking about 650 millimeters of mercury when when the silicon oil enters the eye so it's it's i think and then you have the dual control from with the constellation when you inject it and you aspirated it but perhaps if you mess something about fluidics in that part i think it's very tricky so i i, I like to do fluid air exchange and air silicon oil exchange very good thank you so much martin uh let's move forward our next speaker is nicolaus Zampalis from germany please nico Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm going to try to speed up the introduction because um, it's already been done. Um, no, that's not the one I want to share. Hmm. Can you stop? Can you, can you um, go back? I want to share another screen, not this one. Okay. How can I do it? Let's start. I'll stop it. You first open your video, then you share the screen. Yeah. Okay. I like the background, Nico. Really nice. <laughs> Can, can you play my video? Yeah, sure. Just a second. Let's use this way. So I'm going to share a case of a uh, giant wrestling tear. <laughs> so that's the reason I don't have to do any introduction about it. Um, it's a case I've done four years ago, and um, it's amazing uh, that by the uh, <coughs> length of this tear, it's about uh, seven hours. Big, uh, the macula was still. So um, I start the case doing a core vitrectomy and trying to understand the whole uh, anatomy of the vitreous in these um, unrolled. Uh, um, retina facing the macula and uh, i'm just removing the videos behind the retina it's a uh, strange place to find victors behind the retina but uh, that's how it is because of the gravity the retina faces the macula and uh, the videos uh, is on top of the uh, rolled retina and um, in these cases they, um, there are some things that happen that um, may uh, need some improvisation like um, now it's just a calm boring vitreous uh, removal but what what happens um, as i 
move a little bit superiorly. Nothing happens, but uh, suddenly, oops. <laughs> so, iatrogenic complications happen. Um, if something like that happens, you have to um, stop, think, and keep on uh, doing your surgery. It bleeds some uh, a little bit, so um, to um, not endanger the visualization, I just uh, did some uh, endodiathermy on these uh, bleeding vessels. Um, and kept doing the peripheral sh shaving. Um, uh, here you can see some retinectomy of the peripheral uh, retina, um, which is not needed functionally. So uh, I always remove that in order to be sure that I remove the uh, peripheral vitreous. Um, here I'm checking if there's any posterior vitreous uh, there, but. Um, PVD was already there. Um, at this point, there is some kind of deja vu, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to uh, see this complication for the third time, so I used some PFCL, uh, which I normally don't use in normal retinal detachment surgery. Um, but in this case, you have to stabilize the uh, mobile retina, otherwise um, you might end up damaging uh, functional uh, tissue. Um, I kept doing the peripheral vitrectomy and found some other tears peripherally. I didn't use a chandelier light in this case. It could have been better, I guess, but uh, I had really experienced uh, assistant who's, who was doing some uh, uh, scleral depression. We're going to see it in a while. meticulous removal of the vitreous. Uh, it was a fake vitrectomy, by the way, 23 gauge. Um, you can see now about six o'clock and beyond uh, the skull depression and the removal of the peripheral vitreous. When doing that, um, sometimes you're so peripherally that you can also see the uh, ciliary body on the upper right corner of the uh, screen. This is a similar body. And uh, after finishing the whole vitrectomy, um, you have to choose if you either use uh, a gas or silicon oil. And I uh, don't choose before seeing the, uh, the way the retina uh, is reattached under uh, air. So during the fluid air exchange and during the massage of the uh, retina trying to uh, reattach it as uh, perfectly as possible anatomically, then drying the edges using the, using the vitreous cutter. Um, the visualization is a little bit uh, difficult under air, but um, if you are able to flatten the retina perfectly under air, you will have a postoperative uh, result that's going to be really good. I even used this iatrogenic break superiorly to drain some middle peripheral uh, subretinal fluid. You can see the bleeding there. And uh, as soon as I was uh, happy with the result, I started putting some laser spots uh, under air. Um, you can see here that the whole retina is uh, glowing attached and um, it's looking really good so um, in this case that's why i wanted to show it i didn't use oil as i would normally do for such a uh, advanced um, extended retinal detachment but i used uh, a gas um, mixture i used um, air with uh, SF6 and uh, C3F8. Um, after being sure that the pressure was good, I decided to suture every sclerotomy. That's something I don't do. Um, after the transconductival uh, uh, trocar based surgery, but uh, in this case, if you lose some air uh, postoperatively, uh, the retina is not going to be tamponated uh, enough, sufficient. So uh, I always suture 
this gas-based uh, vitrectomies in order to make sure that the tamponade, the uh, volume of the gas I used, uh, stays there and uh, um, offers a sufficient tamponade post-operatively. Um, if you have some uh, pressure issues, you can, of course, remove some air post-operatively, but, uh, but uh, um, the tamponade and the uh, risk of redetachment makes me sure to the splodomies in these cases. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Nico. Really nice case. It was nice to see someone suturing because people think you don't need to suture anymore and it makes the whole difference. Really difficult case. These are all always. Yes, Martin, go ahead. Yes, uh, lovely, Nico. Uh, very nice, nice cases. So I, I use sutures a lot, uh, like transconch sutures of bicryl and I remove them usually between the first and second day post-op. Um, and uh, always in when, when I use silicon oil, and sometimes when it's a, uh, if, you, if you do a, a really perfect peeling of the uh, vitreous base, so there's no vitreous that tamponade inside the air, and uh, you often have air or gas or, or some kind of, uh, of leakage so i think it's very important to leave the eye with the correct pressure uh, in the post-op mm. there's I no agree mm. yeah really good congratulations so our next speaker thank you our friend from cairo ahmed he's a professor at the university he's a great surgeon anterior and posterior my friend ahmed welcome go ahead Yes, thank you, thank you, Gustavo, for and Lucan for the invitation. Let me share my screen now, <clears throat> so you can see it now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. Actually, I'm going to present a couple of cases uh, about unusual uh, surgical situations that we may face, uh, particularly in juvenile age group. The first case here is a 23 years old male patient who presented with a very long-standing history of diminution of vision, actually since birth. And he had a history of a surgery for congenital cataract, and as we can see, the anterior segment is a fake cake with some fibrous capsular uh, proliferations, and after cataract, his vision was hand motion, and uh, there was no uh, any uh, 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 view for the fundus in this patient. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the patient came to me asking for a surgical solution for this very long-standing uh, situation for him since birth. He actually is not seeing with this eye since birth. So, um, I have a problem with switching, yes. So, I ordered for an ultrasound for this patient, and you can see the exit length of this patient was 22.5 million, millimeters. Uh, there was this hyper-reflective echoes extending from the over the optic disc uh, all the way to, to, uh, to the anterior retina and the peripheral part of the retina, and denoting a, a closed funnel uh, a closed funnel uh, total retinal detachment. However, his electrophysiology have uh, pointed to some uh, functioning retina in here. So, after careful discussion with the patient and proper counseling, we decided we decided to go for the surgery. I don't know what's wrong with him. And this is the surgery here. Uh, this surgery was performed using. Uh, the uh, RTV 800 digital microscope, I have no financial interest. And uh, as we can see at the start of the surgery, we can get some points of, uh, some areas of red deflex that point through this uh, fibrous proliferation of the capsule. This could denote some uh, functioning retina behind, as I was very suspicious at the beginning of the surgery that this retina could be really functioning. So I started to go with uh, the uh, cutter through the pars plana, removing this very sticky cortical material that had been present for 23 years inside this eye, and then going by manually uh, stripping off all uh, the sticky cortex uh, and stripping off uh, the uh, after cataract and uh, using the high vacuum. Uh, and after cleaning of the central area now, I will have to deal with this very thick uh, fibrous uh, component in here. 
so actually, I introduced uh, my uh, pick and uh, uh, targeting, targeting the cutter, trying to uh, aspirate this very thick fibers capsule, lowering my cut rate to 500 and increasing my vacuum to 450. But have, however, this was not very successful in bringing out this very thick fibers capsule. So uh, it seems like this uh, fibers part is very sticky and is added to something uh, uh, behind uh, or posteriorly or inferiorly or through a vitreous cavity. So uh, I decided to go to the back of the eye, and here comes the surprise. This actually was a case of a persistent fetal vascular. Feature. It's not a total closed uh, final retinal detachment, and this patient uh, is, was diagnosed uh, for a long period of his time, uh, for a long period of time throughout his life as a closed final retinal detachment. So uh, after uh, carefully inspecting this fibrous stock, I, I, I turned into bimanual surgery, plugged in my uh, chandelier light, and decided to cut this fibrous stock at the point where it is least vascular, the most anterior part. After a very uh, after the repeated attempts to cut this very thick fibrous part with a scissor and the forceps. Uh, finally, I was able to cut it uh, through uh, the most thin part of it, as you can see here, uh, and release this fibrous stock from the anterior uh, part of the eye. Now this fibrous stock is freely floating, and we can easily uh, trim it and remove it with a cutter. However, this has to be done very cautiously, and after careful inspection uh, uh, of any bleeding that could happen in order to cauterize it immediately in case of a persistent artery. So I have to stop here at this point, because uh, the retina uh, usually uh, encroaches over this fibrous stalk, and you have to stop. As we can see with the arrows, you have to stop at this point, because this is the point where the retina begins uh, over the posterior pole. So uh, uh, after finishing this, I had to complete my vitrectomy, injecting my uh, uh, trimcidolone. And as we all know that these patients will have a very sticky posterior hyaloid, and the removal and uh, induction of the posterior vitreous attachment in this case would be very difficult uh, in order to strip off this posterior uh, cortical material. Uh, from uh, the retina and stripping it off or, or over uh, this uh, fibrous, uh, fibrous stalk and completing my vitrectomy. And then I have to proceed to complete radical vitrectomy, shaving of the vitreous base. Uh, and, uh, and a very important point here, I have to check all the periphery of the retina in all quadrants in order to uh, uh, make sure that there are no any connections of the retina with any residual fibrous uh, proliferation or fibrous part of the uh, stalk. Uh, so it, the retina was uh, clean here, and I, I went to inject an intraocular lens here, a three-piece lens, uh, was injected into the senior circus. And uh, this patient, and this uh, was the end of the surgery. So this was a case of a persistent fetal vasculature after 23 years, and it was diagnosed as a closed final retina detachment. This is the post-operative picture when the fiber stalk is retracted over the disc, and we can see how healthy the retina looks like. This is the OCT where we have an intact ellipsoid zone in the quarter layer, but we have thinning of inner retinal layers. However, this patient can achieve the vision of 0.5 uh, in, the, in, in the first week post op This was my first case, and I can proceed uh, with the second case now. Uh, this actually is a case of another uh, juvenile uh, detachment in a 14 years old female who presented with sudden diminution of vision. We can see that her, she has a, an iris coroboma, and fundus examination has shown a very huge choroidal coroboma involving the optic disc and macula. And so the decision was to, uh, was to operate on this patient uh, performing a lens sparing vitrectomy, silicone oil, and endo laser. And this uh, will be the surgery. As we start here, they can see that uh, this is an iris coroboma and it affects really the dilatation of the pupil, a huge choroidal coroboma involving the optic disc and involving uh, the macula. And the preoperative assessment of this patient did not provide any uh, proof for any retinal tears. So we would expect in these patients that retinal tears are present inside this area of the coroboma itself. Uh, so uh, we have to deal with the patient as if we have a, a posterior retinal break. Induction of the posterior hyaloid here is very difficult as well. Uh, it's very adherent in this young patient as a juvenile patient. And additionally, it's very adherent over the, over the coroboma. So, the, so, so we have this intercalary membrane, which is very adherent to the posterior hyaloid. Uh, additionally, there is a posterior staphyloma in this patient which makes posterior vitreous attachment. It's a very difficult procedure too. Uh, and we have to strip off the posterior vitreous in all quadrants in order to achieve a successful uh, outcome for this patient in particular, and strip the uh, posterior hyaloid here again over the posterior, uh, over the colobomatous uh, area. After that, uh, we we'll perform uh, vitreous base shaving as a routine, and this patient is thick, and we're trying to preserve the lens as much as we can, so we have to make uh, the indentation directed posterior to avoid injuring the lens. Then we go to the, uh, drain the subretinal fluid, and as we expect that the tears are present inside the coloboma, we can find that the uh, subretinal fluid is already trapped in the periphery. It's not being uh, drained, so 
uh, a drainage, a peripheral drainage unit not only has to be performed in this case in order to uh, relieve this subarachnoid fluid and, and in drainage unit not only was performed followed by fluid air exchange in order to drain the peripheral fluid and then in the laser in the laser was applied over this um, drainage retinotomy, as we can see here. Then I like to perform a 360 laser photocoagulation because I would not, not like to miss any uh, small holes that have been uh, created maybe through uh, protection of peripheral vision. A very important point in coloboma, we have to surround the colobomatous area actually with one or two layers of laser because we, in, in most of the cases, the retinal tears or breaks are present inside the coloboma or at the edge between the coloboma and the uh, functioning retina. So uh, a, complete, a complete surrounding of the coloboma with the laser is a very important step uh, in these cases. Then we proceed with direct uh, petrol or carbon silicon oil exchange. So the surgical challenges in a case of a choroidal coloboma include the loss of pigmentation at the side of the choroidal coloboma, making the laser photocoagulation not possible. It's always difficult in identifying the breaks preoperatively, and we can detect them intraoperatively under high magnification, usually in the area of the choroidal coloboma itself. Uh, commonly adherent posterior hyaluronic in uh, juvenile patients and difficult post-operative positioning may be required in these patients. However, these patients are young and we can never convince them of the post-operative positioning, especially that we will require a long period of uh, contact between the tamponading agent and the coloboma. Uh, finally, anatomical alterations in the colobomatous eyes like retinal thinning, posterior staphyloma, and the poor dilatation will also be uh, surgical challenges in these uh, cases. And this is was uh, this was my presentation. Thank you so much. Very good. Nice, really nice, really really good, Ahmed. Difficult cases, close funnel, coloboma. Are you a reference for pediatric cases in your university? <laughs> Tell me. No, not not really. No, <laughs> I try to escape from the pediatric cases actually. <laughs> <laughs> not nice, really. nice. Really good. Sibel, go ahead. You're muted. You're muted, Sibel. I, I, I have some comments on the first case. I, I have uh, one of two cases uh, like that. Uh, the, probably your first case had both anterior and the posterior PHPV at the beginning, and the, some surgeon, anterior segment surgeon, uh, did the first one and then uh, lead to misdiagnosis as a, a closed funnel uh, PHPV. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, in that case, there can be abnormal connection with the, in between the retina and the ciliary body. Retina can go to the ciliary body. Uh, it is not rare, actually. You can see some kind of variation in the periphery in this case, and that's why we have to be very careful while we are putting the trocars in the periphery. Some people try to use limbal um, vitrectomy in these cases, uh, because they can have some variation in the periphery. And uh, this is the first thing I want to emphasize. And uh, some people believe that for posterior PHPV, if it is not severe, some people just diatomy it and cut it and leave it there without any vitrectomy. What do you think about that? Uh, because you try to induce the posterior hyaluronic detachment, all these things like a normal vitrectomy. And some, I, I, I do that, I, I, I do like that, like you do. But some people believe that just cutting is enough. What do you think about that? I mean, uh, I would cut the the, uh, the fiber stock and just uh, do yeah. not perform a complete vitrectomy. I don't yeah. like to do this actually because I feel that the vitreous is uh, vulnerable to being attacked. If you attack the vitreous, you have to attack it completely and completely remove it. Otherwise, you will develop post-operative PVR, especially in a young patient. So I think I would, if I go for vitrectomy, I perform a radical vitrectomy removal of all the vitreous that I can. Uh, this uh, remaining layer of the posterior hyaluronic can later on proliferate and bring me uh, epiretinal proliferations or epiretinal membranes, especially in these young patients. And this could be uh, an indication to go back to the surgery and remove the hyaluronic. So I, I try to do it uh, uh, radically from the start. Yeah, I believe so. First, we just surgery. And so, uh, yes, were you able to, in the last case, in the coloboma cases, were you able to find out the retinal tears inside the coloboma? No, actually I didn't, but uh, I, had, I had a clue. When I, when I injected the perfluorocarbon over the posterior pole and trying to drag subretinal fluid all over to the periphery, all the, all the fluid was trapped all around, like a skirt. 
So there was no any uh, any site of exit for this uh, for this uh, subretinal fluid in the periphery. So I might expect that this retinal tears should be inside the area of the coloboma itself. Uh, actually, they could be uh, like uh, trophic holes or it could be tears at the edge of the coloboma. So in most of the cases, they, they develop inside the, these uh, very rudimentary tissue that covers the coloboma area, uh, like atrophic holes, for example. And uh, what it was confirmed in this case when I injected the perchlorocarbon posteriorly over the posterior pole, and you get the, all the subretinal fluid trapped in the periphery, so you have no uh, point of exit for the subretinal fluid, so probably it was in the posterior pole. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Really good, but not just rare, but these cases, Ahmed, that they are really difficult. Congratulations. Really, really skilled. So Thank you. Uh, we are going, we are finishing our time. Actually, we passed a little bit, but I would like to thank everyone who has been so far with us. Nihon Arigato, Turkey, Teşekkür ederim, Deutschland, Dankeschön. How you say Egypt in Arabic? I have forgotten. Masr. 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 Masr, shukram. Argentina, gracias. Bulgaria, blagodaria. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, Gustavo, for, for the invitation. Finishing. Thank, Thank you. you all. Congratulations. Congratulations. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for all attendees for being with us.